I'd like to welcome you on our talk, Nano Enigma, Uncovering the Secrets Within Ephus Memories. Uh, first of all, allow me a brief introduction. Uh, my name is Martin, and I'm here together with my colleague Michal. We also have a third partner in crime named Hayan. However, he couldn't come here with us, so we just have pre-recorded message from him. Uh, we all work in the embedded system security testing team that's based in Prague, Czech Republic, which is under Accenture umbrella. And we all have different fields of focus. So for me, that's reverse engineering. So I'm usually that person that wants that firmware image unencrypted. So making me shut up was partial motivation of this talk. Uh, I'm pretty sure the other guys will tell you briefly about themselves when their time comes. So I'm just going to jump straight ahead into the overview. Uh, we have it in the title. We will be talking about eFuses. And eFuse is an electronic component, which is just uh, two points interconnected with a connection that has a property that it burns or terminates when the current flowing through it exceeds certain threshold. Uh, this is really useful when you want to protect your home appliances from overcurrent, uh, but it's also really useful when you want to create something called one-time programmable memory. Uh, because if you re represent bits with e-fuses, once you change state of a bit from zero to one, you cannot ever unchange it back to zero. This basically means that you can change the state of the device permanently. This is really useful for security because now you can use these types of memories to, for example, disable debugging interfaces or enable secure boot or put their public keys for secure boot. However, some manufacturers took it one step further and they actually used these eFuse-based memories for storing information that requires confidentiality protection. Uh, meaning that uh, you can find there also flash memory encryption keys or passwords for debugging interfaces. Uh, but since I mentioned that that connection burns or terminates, there's actual physical change inside that component. So how do you protect confidentiality of something that could be observed through microscope? Because for example, if I Google eFuse microscope, you're going to get all the images like burnt and unburnt examples. So the protection measure you, you mainly used in some of the chips we looked at was layering. So layering is normal way of making chips where you stack components on top of each other. However, if you put that eFuse-based memory in the very bottom layer, you can then consider it protection because you can't directly observe it. Uh, this is based mainly on an assumption that performing the layering process, so removing carefully the layers from the chip so that you can extract information from it, is a very complex and expensive process. But we are here at DEF CON because we have proved this assumption wrong. And we will demonstrate to you all these techniques on an ESP32 chip from Espressive. However, keep in mind that all of what we will be presenting here is also generally applicable to just about any chip that is using an eFuse-based memory. And with that, uh, I'd like to pass my word to Michal, who's going to walk you through the details of the attack. Hello, my name is Michal Grigarek, and I'm, <laughs> I'm also a proud, uh, uh, sorry, I'm also a part of uh, Accenture Prague. At first, I must say I am really proud to be here uh, on this stage uh, to present you results of, of, of our work. Uh, so my colleague Martin just explained uh, what uh, EFUSE is for. And now let's uh, take a look more closely uh, how we can uh, observe uh, these structures in uh, much more detail and uh, what technologies and skills uh, we will need. First, uh, we must uh, decapsulate uh, the chip. Decapsulation is the process uh, when we extract the silicon plate from the, from the epoxy housing. Uh, of course, there are, exist uh, some other material for, for housings, but uh, for uh, purposes of this presentation, we only consider uh, only epoxy materials. Uh, there we see uh, four basic, epoxy, uh, four basic uh, technique uh, for decapsulation. Thermal, chemical, laser, and plasma. Uh, thermal method, uh, this method uh, uses uh, only a blowtorch or a heat gun, simply the heat up uh, the uh, epoxy housing and then slowly and carefully break it and uh, obtain the uh, epoxy, uh, oh, so, sorry, epoxy silicon, uh, silicon plate. Chemical decapsulation uses uh, concentrate chemicals, concentrate acid uh, to dissolve uh, the epoxy housings. 
laser etching, use a strong uh, laser beam uh, to vaporize the, the epoxy material. But uh, uh, this method is quite risky because uh, it is uh, very easy to burn the, um, the silicone plate. And the uh, main problem is it lies in, uh, um, in the heat deposition uh, to, the, to the sample. And the last uh, plasma one, uh, this process involves uh, ionized gas or plasma to selective etching uh, of materials. So, so <laughs> due to its availability and good traceability, we decided to use a chemical method of recapsulation. Uh, especially, uh, we used concentrated acid. In our case, uh, con concentrated acid means 96% of, uh, 90, of uh, uh, concentration, uh, which must be heated uh, to, to the approximately 250 degrees Fahrenheit. The chemical method can be effectively uh, combined with laser ablation. At first, laser removes a large part of the housing, and then uh, the remi remaining uh, then can be dissolved in the acid. This uh, short uh, process, uh, to, um, during the chibi's expo exposure uh, to the acid, which is needed. Uh, the, the, uh, sorry, the, the acid <laughs> will, will dissolve the housing residue until, uh, until leaving only the dye. Yeah. Of course, uh, we must use appropriate protective, protective equipment. After this um, process, we obtain uh, a beautiful etched, uh, etched chip uh, suitable for, uh, for other, uh, other investigation. Because uh, chip has typically metallization on its two layers, Uh, we, do not, we do not see any internal layers at the first, uh, so uh, we, must, uh, we must etch the, the surface to obtain this, uh, these structures, and this process is called, uh, called uh, the layering. Again, uh, we have seen uh, on this slide uh, four types of basic uh, method of the uh, layering. Mechanical is the cheapest and uh, starting about uh, $100, uh, $100. Chemical, when we consider only chemical, it is uh, also not expensive. Uh, laser ablation use a very short, precise femtoseconds uh, pulses of, uh, of laser beam uh, to, ablate, uh, to ablate the surface, but it's uh, quite costly starting at uh, 50, uh, 50K USD. And the last, the plasma, uh, this, this is simply the nanomachining using an, uh, an ion beam. Offers uh, p maximum precision, but, but uh, comes, of course, with maximum pr pr um, price tag as well. Due to um, cost effectiveness, we uh, choose to mechanical etching uh, with a whetstone. I just slide a piece of silicon uh, with, with my finger uh, over the stone. Of course, we must uh, use a grinding stone with uh, highest possible grit size. In our case, uh, it's 8,000 grit. Uh, of course, it uh, requires some, uh, some skill, and I personally, personally mastered it uh, uh, around 10, 10 samples. Too much pressure quickly obtained the background, and it means uh, we must start again. But uh, with, uh, with patience and uh, systematic polishing, we can obtain um, beautiful etched chip within, within 30 minutes or an, uh, one hour. Unfortunately, whetstone uh, etching alone is, uh, isn't, uh, isn't enough. Our stone head grain size about two microns. But for the final stage, uh, it is necessary to use the, a diamond lapping foil. Uh, which a grain size uh, has less, uh, less than 0 0.5 microns. This foil has made a significant difference, um, providing a much more smoother surface, and of course reducing the scratch, number of scratches. 
Uh, I tried to <laughs> prepare the sample on the industrial uh, machine costing, uh, costing around 60, 65 uh, KSD. And uh, as, uh, as we see on, this, uh, on these pictures, um, mostly the same results can be achieved when, when I use uh, uh, wet knife etching stone uh, and the lapping foils purchased on AliExpress for 100 bucks. Another important task uh, is to locate the effuse memory bank itself. The largest, para, uh, the largest uh, part of, of the chip uh, is uh, taken up by uh, logical circuits. It is uh, easily identified and um, uh, can be skipped. The other radio frequency part is, uh, is um, um, good, good visible too and can be, sk can be skipped. And the rest uh, we left with the rectangular purple areas and these are memory types uh, such as RAM, flash and uh, our effuses. The effuse memory cells is uh, essentially a fuse, uh, which is a conductive structures uh, with, uh, with a weakened point. In our case, it looking like a triangle uh, with a line going, going through it. It's looking like a flag, maybe. And at uh, approximately 500 times magnification, clear repeating isolated structures uh, of our effuses um, become visible. They are uh, relatively small, and uh, each effuse represents uh, one's bit is uh, smaller than uh, one micron. We have uh, successfully located these uh, effuse banks on uh, ESP32 uh, version S2, S3, and C6. It is uh, positioned slightly differently on the C6, but uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the construction is, is, the, is the same. And now optical microscopy. Observation with optical microscopy has its limits. Uh, maximum resolution of optical microscopy is around 400 uh, nanometers, which correspond with uh, 2,000, magnif 2000 times magnification. There is nearly physical limits. This um, magnification is suitable for uh, locating our, uh, our structures, our effuse bank. And uh, on well prepared sample, we can even see if the if the effuse is uh, burned or not, or programmed or not. The term "burnt" is uh, fitting because uh, when we program data into the uh, effuse memory bits, um, during programmation, going through, going uh, current flow uh, uh, through the fuse and physically change its structures, and these, uh, these uh, changes are observable by the optical or um, elect uh, scanning electron microscopy uh, technology. For the size comparison, uh, a human hair is uh, 100 times bigger than, uh, than our effuses. In order to read their states correctly and repeatedly, we of course need some uh, much more advanced imaging technique and it is scanning electron microscopy, which is provide much more uh, higher uh, resolution. Scanning electron microscopy provides approximately 100 times uh, uh, better resolution. Uh, as I said, since optical microscopy has uh, resolution around uh, 400 nanometers, scanning electron microscopy has a resolution approximately uh, five nanometers, which correspond to magnification 100,000 uh, times. Of course, these parameters uh, can apply uh, specifically to our scanning electron microscope. It is uh, Hitachi FlexM. Uh, the image compares the level of uh, detail we can achieve uh, with uh, these methods, and the difference is significant. This is uh, what the effuse look like at even high magnification using a large electron microscope. And this image shows their 3D structures, which, uh, which essentially looks like a printed circuit board. Everything is visible at the nano scale. Uh, on the right image, right button, we, we see detail of uh, unburned effuse, clear effuse, representing uh, logical zero. 
And on the left image, we, we see burnt ifus uh, representing uh, log logical one. Once uh, we obtain uh, high resolution images of our refuses, uh, we can read the data stored uh, in them. In my initial experiments, uh, I manually transcript uh, the data to the Excel, bit by bit, fuse by fuse, <laughs> Uh, which, which was a uh, very uh, extremely time consuming uh, uh, and uh, it requires intense focus to avoid error because bits, uh, bits look very similar. Yeah. It takes about uh, ten, uh, 10 hours to read uh, one bit of uh, 4096 bits and additionally mapping the logical memory address to a specific cell on the silicon die was also very, very challenging. I had to carefully read and transcript about 20 kilobytes of data before we had, uh, uh, we had enough for our analysis. It is <laughs> truly feels like a forensic, forensic investigation. And now my colleague uh, demonstrate how to assign a logical address to a physical location of given memory. Please, Martina. Thank you, Michale, for extracting all, your da all this data during your vacation. Uh, now that we have the raw data, we have to somewhat put meaning to it so that we have some useful information out of it. Uh, the best place to start with is documentation because it actually mentions a lot of information about both logical and physical alignment of the memory. From the logical perspective, it will tell us that there are 11 of EFUSE blocks and that blocks 0, 1, and 2 are used for system purposes. These basically store MAC address, chip ID, and chip configuration that you can set. Uh, the rest of the blocks are user programmable, meaning you could put whatever you want there. However, their primary purpose is actually to store the secure boot keys or the flash memory encryption keys. Uh, from the physical perspective, the information is a little scarce, but it will tell us that there are four backups of block zero, meaning that any single e-fuse burned in block zero will actually result in four actual fuses burned. And blocks 1 to 10 are using read Solomon coding scheme for automatic error correction. This is just 12, by 12 bytes added to each of the blocks, uh, but it could prove useful in case we cause some damage during the delayering process, so we'll talk about that briefly later. So with that, let's summarize what we want to know. We have a, a lot of bits. We now need to assign them to the bytes. Then we want to take those bytes, put them in the correct order, and have them assigned into blocks, and then voila, we will have our uh, flash memory encryption key. To do that, we performed several experiments, and the first one was a really stupid one, and I came up with it. And it was like, let's burn values FF into the first block of an eFuses so that we can locate where it is. However, at that time, we didn't really know how painful it is to actually read them. So we kind of wasted this experiment, because if you burn only FF values, you can very well detect where the first block is but you really can't detect how the bit assignment works inside these bytes and how the byte order works in the blocks because that information just doesn't exist in such uh, uh, a memory. So we quickly transitioned to the second experiment. In this case, we were a bit smarter, so we burned in uh, unique patterns into the eFuse blocks, and these unique patterns had something in common, and that is that the most significant bits of all of the bytes in these patterns had, uh, were set to one, either three or four of them. Uh, this was because, just from an overview of the memory, if you look at the middle picture, the big one, you can see a lot of red color in the upper portion, those are the ones, and that the lower portion has a lot of variety in it. Uh, you may think there's an ASCII text written at the bottom line, on, at the bottom of the picture. There are no hidden messages, this is purely coincidence. Uh, but if we take the only useful information from the very first uh, experiment and filter out in those Excel files the rows that were associated with the b first block, we can clearly see our pattern. So in this case, we now know that the bits are organized in columns with the most significant bits in the upper portion of the memory. And we also know the byte and DNS inside the blocks. So this is enough for us to just extract any information we want from these memories. Uh, we did several other experiments, mainly to confirm that the memory is uh, working the same way also on the other lines of the chip. So we did on S2, S3, C6, as Michal was saying. And the third one I'm showing you here isn't really interesting from the memory layout evaluation, uh, but it's rather interesting because of those white fields there. Um, 
again, I am to blame for that, uh, because when you do the delayering on the whetstone and you don't clean the whetstone, you have a debris that's left there. And when you keep scratching with your finger, you create these gigantic canyons in that memory where the e-fuses are just completely gone. Uh, in this case, that read Solomon automatic er error correction could actually prove useful to recover the information. However, for like future proofing these methods, we rather spend the time of on improving the delay ring method because, for example, block zero here doesn't have any automatic error correction and the other chips don't have that as well. It was just that in case of ESP32, if you do some damage to the chip, you can actually recover for it using this automatic error correction. Uh, so now, this image will show you the layout of the memory. So the full green row at the top and the bottom of the picture and six others, full green rows in between. That's block zero, so that's where those four times duplicated values actually go to. Uh, for example, if you disable JTAG, that's where four e-fuses will be burned. And the rest of the colorful blocks, and I'm sorry for using too many shades of green, but I'm bad with the colors. Anyway, the rest of the color of uh, rest of the blocks here are the user writable blocks. Most tutorials on the internet will just tell you, please put your encryption key into the purple one here. So that's where we will be focusing the most. Uh, but it, once you know the alignment of the blocks, it doesn't really matter which blocks you extract. You just get the coordinates from the extracted data. Uh, the biggest problem at this point was that Michal refused to read that manually uh, anymore after whatever amount of bits he read. So we had to turn to our machine learning guru to help us automate the process. Uh, his name is Hayan and he unfortunately couldn't be here with us. Uh, but he pre-recorded the message, uh, pre-recorded his part of the presentation, which I'll try to play now. There's about a 50% chance it's going to play. Uh, if it does not, I will still play it and I'll try to comment it so you will not learn anything useful. So let's see. Hello, I'm Hayan Ali, Security Delivery Senior Analyst in Accenture. And also I'm doing PhD in using machine learning with mobile networks. I will go through so the automation process and show you finally the more about it. Let's go. Instead of a visual reading of the effuses from the images, we automated the process. We started from the output of microscope where there are around 200 images for each bank. First, we stitched these images to get only one image per bank, then pre-processing before applying the machine learning, then applying the machine learning object detection model, then uh, extracting uh, the effuses values into the arrays. The microscope provides high-resolution images when working in zigzag mode. In zigzag mode, the microscope scans the pan in zigzag line, as we see here in the figure, generating around 200 images for each bunk. Each image is 2560 by 1920. We can see this uh, image is a high-resolution image, as we can distinguish between the off effuse, which is the default state, and the blown one, which is the on uh, case. We keep margin by 35% between images to avoid uh, wasting any pixels. Then we stitch uh, these uh, images to get one image per bank. But when using the embedded stitching tool in the microscope, we got bad stitching. For example, there is misalignment between 0 and 1, or 2, 1, 2, 2, or between first row and second row. The reason behind this misalignment is that uh, the margin is theoretically 35%, but practically speaking, is something random around this value. That's why we suggested a new stitching method. In this method, to stitch two images, one and two, we define comparison strip in the first image and look for the similarest strip to it in a searching area in the second image. The searching area is uh, plus minus 200 pixels around the margin line. When defining the similarest strip, we determine the margin accurately and also the, the vertical shift between images. Here we can see the result of stitching image one and two. The advantage of this method is too accurate, but downside is the long time it takes. For example, to, to stitch 200 images to, to constitute 
one bank image it will take around five hours here we can see the result of stitching for one bank image uh, its high resolution image is uh, three four thousand by twelve thousand image to effectively use AI to extract the fuses we use Jetson HX or Infirm Nvidia it has 64 gigabyte RAM and 2048 CUDA cores and 64 tensor cores which makes it good for the uh, image based uh, AI projects like object detection projects. We use also MobileNet SSD model, which provides a uh, balance between speed and accuracy. Uh, this model is trained to detect if uses the images in terms of the coordinates of the if uses in the images and also uh, it's a class whether is it on or off. Here we, we the example of uh, on if use and how it is this is off if use which is the default state of the the if use what is the optimal input of the model we read from the mobile net ssd model uh, documents the optimal size for training and also for inference is 300 by 300. also uh, we should meet another condition which is the uh, object which is if use size to the image size should be bigger than predefined ratio. This ratio in our case is defined using practical experience. It is 0.04. Here we can see the example of the optimal image and we can see also the size of the if use regarding to the image size. We meet these two conditions using resizing and tiling. When tiling the stitched image, we keep 100 pixels overlapping between tiles to be sure that the whole size of if use uh, is exist at least in one tile when training the model we used 3500 training tiles with balance number between on and off if users we used cvat tool which is a web-based ai free uh, tool to annotate the if users here we can see example of annotation we use different colors when the link boxes allow the on and off if uses. The training results uh, are detection accuracy 99%, classification accuracy 97%, and also we got fake detection where none if use objects are predicted as if uses, but these fake detections will be resolved during the post processing after prediction. Now we have stitched image. What do we do to uh, extract the if uses? First, we tile this uh, stitched image to 2500 tiles. Then we apply the inference using the trained machine learning model. That inference results uh, for each tile are three things. First, uh, the coordinates of if uses in the tile and also the classification of the if uses, whether they are on, on, on or off and also the confidence score, which corresponds to how the machine learning model is confident about the classification. These three things, results from all the tiles, will be re-aggregated again on the stitching uh, image. Then the duplicates will be removed uh, with keeping only the highest confidence score. Finally, any if used with a confidence score less than 95% will be visually checked. Finally, we will use DB scan clustering method to define the outliers out of the columns and remove them. Then we use another clustering method to group the if uses in columns and exporting their values uh, into the arrays ones and zeros. We repeat the same process for the another bank as we know uh, there are lower bank and upper bank finally we will get 64 by 64 array and then we'll go through the next steps as my colleagues explained uh, we will extract encryption key from the uh, array and use this key to decrypt the encrypted firmware we will see these steps in the demo let's go
we have firmware image where the main program prints periodically the sentence Hello Las Vegas. This firmware is encrypted, that's why when we look for Hello World, we can find nothing. Here we will see the images of lower bunk and upper bunk of the chip holding the encrypted firmware. Here are the images of lower bunk before the chick. Here the image of stitched lower bunk. You can see the high resolution of the stitched image. Now we will apply the if use detection script. This script will go through the stitched lower bank and upper bank, do pre-processing, tiling of the images, and prepare the images to be optimal input for the model. These tiles will be stored in the folder for inference. This folder. Now, the script will run the machine learning model, which is trained. This model will do the inference and detect the if uses coordinates, if uses classes on and off, and also the confidence scores of the classifications. Starting from the uh, upper bunk, then the lower bunk. The script will store all of these inference results or in folder inference results. Now the script will ask for visually checking the uh, if uses where there are different classifications due to tiles overlapping. For the lower bank, we have 11 if uses should be checked. The checking should be whether the if use unbound means off or bound means on or not if use. For the upper bunk, we have zero if uses to be checked. check visually if the uh, if use with confidence score less than 95%. We have 8 if uses to be checked in the lower bank and 13 in the upper bank. After that, the script will show us the distribution of the effuses in the image. We can not that no all players, and also here the upper bunk. As everything is okay, the script will export the values of effuses as zeros at once. The script also will extract the flash key file which contains the encryption keys of the firmware and here is the 64 by 64 array of ones and zeros. We will use the flash key file to decrypt the encrypted firmware and get the decrypted pen file which is the decrypted firmware. Here is the decrypted.pin file. We should look for hello world in this file and we should find something. And here we are. Thanks. I will go back to my colleagues to conclude the presentation.
Hey, I know it's 3 a.m. in Prague, but hi, Anne, if you're watching, thanks for the video. Uh, now to conclude real quick. If you have an information that you would like to store, oh, if you like have an information that you would like to keep secret and you need to store it in a chip, and you have a choice to do so, please do not put it in an EFUSE-based memory. In the case of ESP32 chip, if you want to encrypt the flash memory, and you really should if you want to, uh, you have no other choices. So in this case, you should use countermeasures such as uh, using a unique key uh, per each chip, not just use the same key for every device. Uh, if you have a choice to store it in some HSM module, physical unclonable functional protected memory or antifuses, whatever you have, it would be a better way uh, because an EFUSE based memory is just readable based on its physical properties and the readability protection methods such as layering, they do increase the effort by putting obstacles in between the malicious actor and the information that you're trying to protect. They don't prevent reading. In this case, we had to destroy the chip in process of recovering this information. But since our goal was to recover an unencrypted firmware image, we didn't really care about that because we don't need it to run. We just want to read the firmware. Uh, the assumption about the delayering being expensive, complex and whatnot has basically been destroyed uh, because if you have a sink, whetstone and at least two fingers, you could do that uh, in your home conditions. And if you also can rent a microscope on your local university for a couple hours to just scan some location on chip, then you can do the recovery of the information at home. So it's rather easy and uh, cheap if you're willing to sacrifice a bit of your fingers. Uh, are there two things I'd like to point out still? Uh, the first one is to thank to Espressive because they allowed us to have this talk and the communication with them was really smooth. So thanks for that. And finally, I'd like to admit to a lie because at the very beginning, I told you that if you burn an EFUSE from state zero to one, you cannot unburn it. I lied because you can. Uh, but the processes around this are really complex and really expensive. So I'd like to keep this as a separate topic for perhaps next time. And we can transition into the Q&A session, which, as I've heard, we will be doing as we will be going. But wait. We also have a giveaway. We have 20 decapsulated ESP32 chips in a wilds that look like that they hold some bacteria, but we promised that they did not. And we, you could just take them and try the, the layering process at home if you want to, or just as a souvenir. So thank you for your attention, and we will be answering questions as we go.